Welcome to a Question Time COVID special program. On tonight's panel, we have Nadeem Zahawi, the minister with the most important job in the UK, delivering the coronavirus vaccine. Labour's Shadow Chancellor of the Exchequer, Annalise Dodds, an immunologist, currently member of SAGE, the government's scientific advisory body, Mark Walport. Joining us down the line, Humphrey Cobbold, boss of the UK's largest chain of gyms, Pure Gym, and palliative care doctor working on the front line in the NHS, Rachel Clark. Good evening. Welcome to you at home. Welcome, of course, to my guest here in the studio, and to Humphrey joining us down the line. Thank you very much for doing so. And our live audience is with us again via video link, as always in these times. And you are the first of our regular QT50 group of audience members. I'm delighted to welcome you, and we will be seeing more of you over the coming weeks and months. And, of course, for all of you watching at home, do join in the conversation on social media at BBC Question Time. Let's hear what you've got to say as well. Our first question tonight is from Susan... D'Souza. Thank you. Both Pfizer and AstraZeneca insist there is no shortage of vaccines. There instead appears to be a huge blockage in our ability to deploy the vaccine effectively, which appears to stem from a lack of joined up planning and refusal to utilize all the resources available to us. If Israel can manage 146,000 vaccinations every day, why can't we do better? Why can't we, Nadine? Susan, thank you very much for the question. So the NHS in England, in Wales, in Scotland and Northern Ireland have put together a delivery plan. Uh, we started on the 8th of December with the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, a vaccine that has to travel at minus 70 degrees centigrade in hospital hubs in England. We then rolled out into primary care which is the most effective way to get to the most vulnerable, which we were focusing on, which is the over 80s. We've now vaccinated one quarter, 25% uh, of people who are over 80. And in two weeks time, they will have that protection uh, when the vaccine begins to really take But in terms effect. of Susan's question, a, am, could we I'm, move faster, learning from so, Israel? So it's, it, it is, it, the, the, the limitation was actually the vaccine uh, delivery. So. With Pfizer-BioNTech, we had to hold back 50% until the regulator, the MHRA, and, of course, the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation, and the four chief medical officers said, actually, we can go to a 12-week interval between doses uh, instead of the three-week interval okay. so that we can deploy all that additional vaccine volume. And now, this week, as of Monday, we got 530,000 doses of the AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine and we've got millions of doses that will come in the next weeks and month to come. Shit. The target that we've been set is to do the first four cohorts by the middle of February. So stretching target, it's an ambitious target because you're talking about, you know, 13 plus million people who will be offered the vaccine. Well, it's just under cohorts. 14 million, isn't it? It's 13.9. Susan, you wanted back in. Thank you. Could I just um, make two points? Firstly, Israel have been deploying out the Pfizer vaccine. So they've had all the logistics issues that we have done, but they've managed to roll out a million vaccines in 12 days. And the second point is um, you mentioned about the 12 week um, gap between the first and second dose for Pfizer. Um, the World Health Organization yesterday were very clear that they uh, reckon that it, well, they stated that it should be between 21 and 28 days maximum gap between the first and the second dose, and in exceptional circumstances, up to six weeks. And this is a really, really important point. I've had five friends of mine contacting me today, specifically worried about why we are not following the World Health Organization rules and advice and Pfizer's advice as well. OK, let me come to this Mark. Really shall, I, shall I come to Mark on that? As Can the, I as just the... say, just, just on... Briefly, Daddy, because so I want to bring but Mark Just in. very briefly, we've done 1.3 million um, vaccinations, a quarter of the over as I mentioned. Between the 4th of January and the 11th of January, you're going to see another step up because the NHS plan and the rollout that has been delivered you know, in, a, in, in, I think... So a how big will that way. step up be, Nadine? What so kind of numbers our target is to get to that 13.9 million that you... No, but um, you talk about a big step up so between the 4th and 11th so of January. How big will that be? I don't want to the numbers because... But you numbers must know what you're aiming for. 
No, of course, but uh, but the the Do data you want to tell us? the data release is tomorrow, and then from next week, every single day, the Prime Minister quite rightly wants to release okay. data every Let me day come to... of how many people we've vaccinated. Mark, but do you want to Mark answer that talk... point about, yes, yes. about the so, gap I mean, in clearly the we're in a race between getting people vaccinated and this new, more transmissible variant, and the numbers speak for themselves. So the reality is that the supply of vaccine is rate-limiting at the moment, so we need to get the maximum amount of protection from the doses of the vaccine that we've got. Um, and so the reality is that the first dose of the uh, Pfizer-BioNTech gives about 70% protection, it's reckoned, and the uh, Pfizer-BioNTech uh, Pfizer one, sorry, the AZ one is 70% and the Pfizer-BioNTech is about 90%. And so if you can give it to 2,000 people and get that protection, then it makes sense to prolong it for 12 weeks. And as long as people get the second dose, then it isn't critical whether you get it quickly or a bit later in terms of getting the secondary immune response. So this has been looked at very carefully. There's no doubt it isn't perfect, but the situation here is the perfect may be the enemy of the good. And what we need to do is to get the maximum protection for the maximum number of people. And under those circumstances, I think most people who are immunologists, who are vaccine experts, and the, the, the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunization have looked at the data. So not perfect, but probably the right thing to do under the circumstances where the vaccine is limited. And, that's and Rachel, you're on the front line in terms of dealing with, with, with patients. Of course, we all desperately, desperately want this vaccine mm. as fast as we can. We want it to work. Mm. Susan's question is about logistics, really, and are we going as quickly as we can? Mm. Well, it's a very, very pertinent question because not only a month after we started rolling out the Pfizer vaccine are three quarters of the over 80s still unvaccinated. And I appreciate there are, of course, logistical issues. It's also the case that tens of thousands of frontline NHS and care staff are also still a month after vaccine rollout began unvaccinated. So, so have I'm, you been vaccinated? I'm sitting here tonight as someone who is completely unvaccinated. I am on COVID wards every day. I'm working with COVID patients. I'm very frightened that I may bring the virus home. Who knows, I may kill my husband. Uh, there are paramedics, nurses, healthcare assistants, doctors, NHS and care workers in their thousands who every day are going into an environment in which the air is thick with COVID and we are completely unvaccinated. So from our point of view, it feels like in the first wave in March and April, we were sent in with woefully inadequate PPE. Again, the, it may be an excuse, it may be reality, but the government's position on that was logistics. It's not our fault, it's a supply issue. Here we are again, second time round, completely exposed to a virus that has already killed over 650 frontline NHS and care staff. So this couldn't be more pertinent. Which is why it's so important, actually, to make sure that frontline health well, well, Nadim, how, how quickly, how quickly can Rachel get... Let, I mean, you're the man in charge. How quickly yes. can Rachel get her vaccine? So you will see this week more health and social care staff are being vaccinated as part of the NHS plan. And then next week, so as soon as we get through category one and two, then move to three and four, by mid-February, I guarantee you, everybody will have been offered a vaccine and should I hope take up the offer and, and be there vaccinated. are 30,000 patients with COVID in our hospitals mm. right I know. now no, so no, mid-February is a long time let's hear from our audience Andrea hi I'd just like to ask uh, what the opinion is the BMJ the British Medical Journal stated that there was concerns from GPs back as far as the middle of December with them having been told to expect the vaccine made plans arrange patient appointments and then the vaccines didn't turn up and uh, uh, P.S., you're, you're actually in the health service, you're a surgeon, you've got your hand up. Yeah, so, I mean, Rachel is absolutely right. I mean, as frontline workers, we are very much exposed uh, to this. She mentioned that 650 people, uh, healthcare workers have died as a result of COVID, but a lot of those healthcare workers have been from the BME community. Uh, and there's been no mention of the increased risk uh, of uh, the, of COVID in the BME community with this vaccine rollout. We are not featured at all on the prioritisation schedules. Uh, and I really want to know why that is. Colette? Um, I can do my question is that obviously we've got a lot of logistical issues. 
Um, and I'm very grateful to everybody who works in vaccines. My husband does. So I think you're doing an amazing job. And my question is, we obviously got quite a few issues and we can see that, you know, what bottleneck, other bottlenecks are we going to hit? You know, we've got a problem with supply. What about when it comes to actually vaccinating people and the concerns that GPs have um, and everybody in the kind of, in other industries like dentists and people signing up to actually become part of the vaccination programme and having to actually go through quite a lot of red tape in order to actually provide themselves to do the service? Annalise, I mean, a lot of concerns coming from our audience. It's worth pointing out, isn't it, that in terms of comparison to the EU, to a number of EU countries, the UK is doing pretty well when it comes to getting the vaccine out. Well, we are, but this really is a race against time, as Mark just said. And ultimately, it was in the UK that we saw the first licensing of this Pfizer vaccine. We've also, of course, had the Oxford vaccine developed in our country. We must be ambitious. And that means saying that that two million a week target has got to be a starting point we need to be moving forward much more quickly. We need to be open about where there are problems. And I think Susan was actually saying there what many of us have heard, that there have been logistical issues and government must be open about where they are. You know, there's a huge amount of goodwill. People want to help in this national effort to get as many people as possible vaccinated. But that means being open about where there are problems, where there are blockages, just like Colette said, where there are logistical issues with getting people signed up. You know, I've had retired healthcare workers in my constituency saying to me that they want to help, but because of the administrative blockages, they can't get through. We had so many problems with test and trace. We can't have a repeat of those issues now when we're rolling out the vaccine. Humphrey. Um, yeah, look, my, my understanding is that some progress at least has been made on some of those blockages, but I think Annalise is absolutely right. Um, in terms of the progress that needs to happen now. It can't be much of a surprise that we need to do a rapid vaccine rollout because we've known about this for about nine months that at some time we're gonna to have to do this. It's, it's a logistics and planning exercise. We heard from Nadine before the show that you know, great people like Emily Lawson, who's a former colleague of mine is involved and these are very good people. But I think you'll find Nadine that there is a willingness across the population and across businesses to do whatever you need, whatever is required to accelerate and deliver this vaccine. I've got 270 sites around the country of gyms, typically the size of four or five tennis courts. I've got three and a half thousand people on furlough who actually the government are paying mainly at the moment is the reality. Um, and we, and I'm sure pretty much every business in our situation that have been you know, battered frankly uh, by this virus, our, our biggest interest collectively as a country um, is seeing us come through this as swiftly as possible. Um, you guys tell us what you need. We'll make what's uh, available to you, what's necessary, and do anything in our powers to make that happen. But let's accelerate the process and be truly ambitious. If we can do a million a week, why can't we do two million a week or three million a week or four million a week? There's enough people and enough goodwill in this country to make that happen. I'm absolutely confident of that. And on that, Nadine, the, the, the community pharmacies, there are 11,000 of them yep. in the UK, have been saying today they, they uh, typically do the flu jab vaccine. They know how to do it. They want to help with the coronavirus vaccine, but they haven't been able to. And we spoke to the trade body just before we came on air, and they said the applications to do so have been closed since the 6th of December. So they cannot help. Why won't you let them help? So can I take you through the plan? Because I think it's worthwhile for your audience. Well, do you to want to just answer that? Are you going to let the community pharmacies we've got, we've got 200 do the jabs? Of them coming online as part of the Because there's 11,000 of them. I that hear. Could help. But can I, if I can just take you through the plan, it's important for everybody here, whether you know Annalise and the Labour Party or the audience. So the plan is you've got hospital hubs; uh, they've been operationalised. Then the primary care network. So five or six GPs in an area of about 50,000 people coming together deciding who will lead, the others will support, uh, and then actually delivering really important work because they can reach the over 80s and they're going into the care homes because they are the, 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 sort of the most vulnerable people to this virus of the over 80s and people in residents of, of, of uh, care homes. And then the NHS frontline and social care, and then we get to groups three and four. Now, just bear with me a second. Beyond the primary care network, so we've got 595 already vaccinating, that by the end of the week, that will rise by another 200 and keep rising. Um, ultimately, we will get to about 1,500 sites because we're adding on national vaccination centres that will come online in days and the community pharmacies. 
which you talk about. So, um, and so when you 115 them in? will come online uh, on the 11th, we're commencing the 11th of this month. Um, to so they can reapply because the applications are closed so, for them so, to do so. So what we're doing is making sure there are two ways to get to what Humphrey quite rightly challenges on, which is to get as many jabs in as many vulnerable Sure, sure, that's why I'm asking about so the community That's pharmacies. what I'm saying. There are two ways of doing it. One, you optimise your most effective route, which is the GP, the primary care network, into those most vulnerable groups. So the throughput you get, how many can they do a day, you optimise that, and you add more sites. So which is why we're bringing on the community pharmacies and the independent sector uh, okay. to be involved, but because that way... You, you add on. Mark now, wants to come. Let's, we, let's, let's, let's one let's last Mark point. Just briefly. really critical. One last point. When you go through cohorts one to four, our, um, our absolute target is to do that by mid-February. When you get to the co cohorts five to nine, you can go even further in terms okay. of sites where you can begin to talk to other industries and the independent sector to actually get more people Mark, to vaccinate. Mark, you want to come and, the, and the critical question really is, what is the rate-limiting step? And... Have we got the vaccine in the vials? That's the really critical question, because the very fact that we've had to delay the second injection suggests that the rate-limiting step is vaccine in vials, and that's where there will be huge competition. And it turns on Rachel's point, which is the disappointment in a way, is that there wasn't the manufacture at risk and testing of sufficient quantity yeah. so that it was there ready to be rolled out. So you Can will know, just Mark. just follow on from that point about but disappointment? Sorry. Because very briefly, because I there are yeah. other questions we need to get in. Unfortunately, there has been a recurring theme throughout this pandemic of the government, particularly Boris Johnson, over-promising and under-delivering. But this is we the NHS hang on. plan. Right. We, no, This is the hang NHS on. plan. The NHS by... is not responsible for Boris Johnson's rhetoric, world-beating, moonshots. Now, on Monday, mm. he looked the nation in the eye and said that his target, which he would deliver, would be 13.9 vac million vaccines by the middle of February. This morning, when you were challenged on that question, you said that you wouldn't bandy around random numbers. The problem is, your Prime Minister did that 20, 48 hours earlier, and at the time... I'm on record as saying... You approvingly tweeted no, him. No, I, I said we will deliver that. I stand by that. We will absolutely okay. deliver for those first four, four cohorts by mid-February. I'm... You know, 13 the, the NHS plan... Well, Nadine, we will be delighted to, to see you that, back on the programme. And I'll be back on this programme. At that point, and we'll see where we because are. Let me take another question. Uh, I, I, if, can we could... We could talk about just about vaccines all night. It's absolutely critical. I appreciate that. But there are other questions our audience of want course, to put, and I'd like to hear them. Chris Oram. Hi, thank you. Um, we have now entered a third lockdown. How many more lives needed to be lost before the government decided to call this lockdown? Now, Chris, I know you're asking this because, and we can see her in the picture behind you, because of what happened to your mother. Do you, do you want to tell us briefly her story? Yes. Yes, so my mum, who's in the picture behind me, she's 58 years old. Uh, I lost my mum on the 9th of April last year um, to COVID. Um, there's, it's, it's been incredibly difficult um, as a family. Um, there are 76,000 families out there that are now grieving the loss of loved ones, um, let alone how this is affecting our key workers. Um, for example, the nurses in that hospital, um, my mum's last support she had in her last moments was having two nurses hold her hands as she passed away. And I know you weren't able to see her, Chris, but she was constantly, when she could, in contact with you and she was talking about the kind of care that she was receiving. Yes, so mum messaged for all, all of the um, nine days that she was in hospital um, she messaged, messaged us last, actually, about four and a half hours before she passed away. Um, the, she said the nurses were amazing there, but they were completely overwhelmed. This was during the first lockdown, um, during the first wave. Um, now, from what I hear, you know, we've got 30,000 people in our intensive care units that are now fighting for their lives. If it's that bad now, it wasn't as bad in the first time, but now it's it's almost three times as worse now than it was in the first. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't want anybody to go through what I'm going through. 
as a family and as 76,000 other families out there are going through the same. Mm, so we've got 30,000, I mean, not in intensive care, I'm glad to say, but nonetheless 30,000 in hospital. Uh, and Rachel, of course, you're treating a lot of those people. Absolutely. And, and Chris, you know, my heart completely goes out to you because I was having the kinds of conversations you were having with nurses and doctors when your mum's life was in the balance in April and I wouldn't wish what she and what you as a family have gone through to anybody, that there seems to be um, an increasing, uh, very vocal minority in Britain at the moment who seems to think that somehow if a human being in British society is above a certain age or has medical comorbidities, which might be something as, as minor as eczema or asthma, then somehow their life is expendable. It doesn't mean anything. It's not worth fighting to save. And I, as a doctor, think that is a, a, a reprehensible Absolutely. position because it divides British society into two tiers. The tier of people we say are worth saving and the tier who we can just do without and expend. So I'm really, really sorry that you are one of the tens of thousands of people who have been through that your and question, this presumably is taking its toll on you. Absolutely. You so, so, so today we have had the absolutely devastating news this afternoon that we have reached a, a, a truly world beating and bleak in the extreme milestone. So today in the last 24 hours, over a thousand people have lost their lives mm. to COVID. Now that's more than every single person who has died in Australia of COVID um, has done in, the, in, in their entire pandemic. We've lost more than the Australian death toll in 24 hours. And in hospitals at the moment, conditions are unimaginable. We have ambulances queuing up outside, uh, patients, we can't get them out of the ambulances into hospitals because every single bed in intensive care, in the wards, in A&E is full. Tonight, I had messages from a doctor in London to tell me that police cars are delivering critically ill COVID patients into his hospital in London because there are no ambulances. That is how bad things are. How, how could the government have allowed things to get so bad? SAGE told the government in September to have a circuit breaker. They told the government before Christmas you have to lock down and Boris Johnson ignored it because he's pathologically incapable of making a difficult decision and that is reprehensible. Mark. Well, I'm afraid uh, the second wave was entirely predictable. I mean, there's no question about that. Um, but I, we are now where we are. And, of course and, the and, critical... and just to be clear, that SAGE, the scientific advisory body uh, that advises the government that you are a part of, mm. You called for tougher measures back in well, September. Well, we presented the evidence and back the in government November that there was as well. likely to be a second wave, and these were the conditions. Obviously, the government is looking at both the direct harms that we're talking about now, also the, the economic damage, the loss to education, and all these other things, and it is for them to balance. But, but did, did, you feel, at, did you feel that your advice was, was what, what, ignored? Well, or, or, I, well I'm, I'm sure not, it the, is for the I'm politicians sure the to decide. But delivered. It, it will need to be an addim that tells us what, you know, what the government decided to do with the advice. But, I mean, the evidence, the job of SAGE is to present the evidence, and SAGE looks absolutely specific really, through the lens of the pandemic and the infection, and it provides advice on that. It doesn't provide the economic advice or the, the other advice. Um, but, I mean, I think the critical thing is now, we, everyone's got to recognise that this lockdown is really serious, and it's not only what the rules are, but the way people obey them that matters as well. So this really is an absolutely critical moment where the numbers are higher than they were in the first wave. In almost everything, we're going to see the deaths continue to rise for several weeks to come. People have really, really got to socially distance themselves now. And Bethany, you, you are working in intensive care at the moment as well. What, what's your experience? Um, I think, to be honest, a lot of what Rachel said really resonates. It's completely awful. Um, I work with an absolutely fantastic team, but everyone's completely exhausted. People with CPAP on on the wards are being found dead um, because there's just not enough people to look after them. There's, well, people there's are being people found dead in, in, in intensive care. No, so we have CPAP patients on the wards as we don't take all of the CPAP patients. So, so these are patients with breathing mass. apparatus? Yeah, um, and there's just not enough people to monitor them. Um, and so the critical care outreach team who work with us in intensive care will go down to see a patient who's found dead. 
Um, and I just hate that the economy is being kind of pitched against human lives. Like a, the economy would be much more functioning if we didn't have this going on, if we'd have gone into lockdown earlier. Yeah. Uh, Annalise? I mean, Labour only called for full lockdown three days ago. Well, I, I just just in the last point that Beth said, though, if I may, I really put, think she put her finger on it, and I want to really underline it because it relates to what Mark just said. That actually, this claim that somehow you can you can trade off the economy against public health, I'm afraid we've seen in spades in this country that just simply doesn't work because when people don't have confidence that they're going to be safe, then they're not actually going out and consuming, they're not going out and working, and actually having this extremely heavy death toll and this very severe impact that we're seeing right now. It has an enormous human cost, but very obviously it has an economic cost as well. The mental health impact of this mm. is having a huge impact on our workforce. That's not something that's just going to finish when this lockdown ends. That will continue for a very long time. Um, in terms of the latest lockdown, um, yes, we did call for a full lockdown before the government announced it. But before Christmas, I have to say, we were very concerned about the situation then. I think we're probably seeing, sadly, because of the, the lag in this disease then coming through into hospitals, we're seeing some of the impact of what happened around that time. And we said repeatedly to government then, please review the evidence around this situation now, it's my understanding that the health secretary was talking about the new strain in parliament on the 14th of december actually the prime minister apparently was informed about it on the 18th of december we didn't have a change in policy for a very very long time and we can't have this what feels like a constant lag between evidence coming through and then action. I mean, Mark, you're, you're nodding away. To well, me. I mean, I think that... It I goes, mean, are you frustrated? Yes, inevitably. I mean, I think this new transmissible variant has made things much, much more difficult. But I think the, the challenge has been, really, that the sort of the policy compromises between managing the economy, work, education and managing the coronavirus has meant that actually damage to neither has been minimised as much as it could have been. Let's see who's got their hands up here. Jim. Yeah, it, um, it seems to me that the, uh, one of the key reasons why um, uh, lockdown occurs is to protect the NHS. And Nightingale hospitals were built uh, superbly uh, in the first lockdown with the help of the army. And they're huge facilities, yet we don't seem to be able to use those. And I know it's because of a lack of resource, i.e. doctors and nurses to actually support those and work in them. I'm just wondering why more hasn't been done to get those resources into play now. James? Well, I think, look, you know, no one ever wants to put the economy before human life, and we seem to have prioritised schools, but at the minute, we're getting none of it right. The economy's in tatters. You know, we've had 1,041 people die today, and schools are shut. We're not getting any of the, you know, balancing act right at all. And Sue, you had your hand up. Yeah, sorry. I was just going to ask the same question that Jim asked earlier. OK, let's hear from, from Dave. Yeah, I think uh, for me, we, we just keep constantly looking backwards and not forwards. We keep blaming government. We keep blaming op the opposition, keep blaming government. We blame the public. We blame all sorts of people. And we're constantly looking backwards. And we're constantly saying, look, you know, this should have happened, that should have happened, we should have put this into place. We need to be looking forward, not backward. We can, all the evaluation, all the, um, you know, the, the, the criticism can be in the future. But now we need to be looking forward. We need to establish a way and a means to go forward with this. And then we can, you know, have all the um, the reflection and all the evaluation afterwards. Too many people, in you know, my opinion, constantly are looking backwards, and I think we really do need to go forwards. George, George, we need to be able to hear you. There you Sorry. go. There's lo there's loads of people out there at the moment who are on furlough. 
and they're being paid to stay at home, but yet they're still going out, taking second jobs and things like that, which is obviously spreading the, uh, the virus around as well. And I think people who actually flout the law, I think it really should be basically made to pay back their furlough payments and fined, because it's, it's, you go to uh, the supermarkets and things like that, there's people refusing to wear masks and, and other people just literally disrespecting what everybody's trying to do, you know, disrespecting the NHS, disrespecting everything what the whole country's trying to do. And it is really, really frustrating, I, I feel, anyway. Humphrey? Um, well, look, I, I run a commercial business, obviously, that relies on being open and not locked down. So I, I've tried to keep our business as safe as possible for as long as possible. But I think Mark hit the nail on the head when he said uh, that, you know, this new variant really changed the game. And I think um, we need to move, you know, needed to move quicker to lockdown than we did move. But, it, but even now, I would challenge us to say, um, shouldn't we be locked down even further? There are still substantial parts of retail and other areas um, that are still open, that it's pretty hard to regard as, as essential. And I have nothing against those parts of retail, but if the if the number one priority that I've heard so clearly articulated by Rachel and by you know, other medics, and I've got a son who works in the northwest of England, he's a fifth year medical student, um, he, he's in hospitals, he's seeing this very live, we've been talking about it at some, at some length. If the number one priority, while we get the vaccine program up to that, um, that three million a day, if we, three million a week if we can, um, it is to limit transmission, mm -hmm. then, you know, the lesson from around the world, I think, is we need to be prepared to lock down really, really hard um, and pull together... So what more would you do, Humphrey? Lock down ...to limit those transmissions. What more would you do? ...admissible virus. What more would you do, Humphrey? Um, I, I think I would, I would close um, all, all the other areas of retail that are not truly essential, and I, I don't tell them any, any joy, but it's hard to regard um, off-licences, garden centres and other forms of retail... Um, of that nature that are uh, essential. Um, I, I would um, really reinforce the calls to stay at home. Um, I still think there's a little bit of, of laxness um, in attitude around, uh, around that. And I, and I think I would reinforce it if necessary, but it's a last resort with punishments that are required. That's what we had to do last time. And maybe we need a bit more of that medicine now. Nadine? So, Chris, I absolutely heart-wrenching story. Uh, my cousin, who's a consultant and anaesthetist in the NHS, got COVID and um, then it, his wife got it. And when it progressively got worse, it was a terrible moment. He's now um, recovered. Uh, but absolutely, your, your, your challenge to us is uh, the right one. And I would just add, and I know people um, uh, have, have sort of touched on it, but when the PM got the uh, data on the 18th of December, we went into tier four on the 19th. Within a day, we went into tier four. And as this new variant has taken hold, uh, we've had to go into this much more severe national lockdown. And so the idea that somehow, you know, we hadn't been um, responding to how the virus is behaving I, I, yeah, There's a big raise of the sense. eyebrows from Mark there, I have to say. Well, I mean, we've just got to look at the numbers rocketing up at the moment. And I think uh, what Humphrey says makes a lot of sense. That we, you know, we know that there is one thing that will stop this virus. It can only carry on if it, through proximity between people. So if we keep people apart, it will come under control. So a tighter lockdown, as Humphrey's suggesting? We, well, we rule nothing out. You can't rule anything out at this stage. The, the best thing I can do... Uh, for the whole country, is to make sure we deliver the vaccines as quickly as possible well, into people's arms, the most vulnerable people, the over 80s, people in care homes, and then the over 75s, the over 70s, um, in, in those categories. And just briefly, as to, quickly to as I can. Jim's question about, about the Nightingale hospitals. Because so, the one in London, for example, I think only 51 beds have been used so, so, out of 4,000. So that, and, well, that's going to be one of the national vaccination centres. So, so those partly, beds are coming out partly, now? No, no, both, both, it's going to be, it's going to be both. So they're prepared uh, uh, for that additional need that the NHS currently is under huge pressure, okay. uh, Rachel says, but also uh, for national vaccination. Chris, you started us off on this subject, uh, talking obviously about your experience with, with your mother and, and all our condolences to you for that, of course. What do you think of what you've heard? 
I mean, well, it still hasn't answered the initial question in the sense of, you know, we still didn't lock down, even though the statistics were there before Christmas. Um, I mean, we can all seem to agree that we probably should have locked down earlier, or maybe we need a more severe lockdown. Have we actually seen the numbers from Christmas, you know, from people actually gathering at Christmas and potentially spreading this virus? Have we actually seen how many people that's going to now affect? Are we ready for it? And do we have the manpower to get that vaccine out there and the manpower in our hospitals to treat those people as those numbers now are going to, they are going to climb, they are going to get worse. More people are going to die from this virus. Well, I think we all know that the numbers are going to climb, certainly for, for a while yet before hopefully they start to come down. Um, I'm going to take another question, but before I do, I just want to say that we will be doing programmes from Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland in the coming weeks. And when we do, we'll be looking for people to join our audiences there. So the week after next, which is the 21st of January, we'll be doing a programme from Northern Ireland. If you live there, you have things to say and you want to contribute, do get in touch. Come and be part of our virtual audience. Go to the Question Time website and you can uh, contact us that way. Fill in the form there. Uh, we would love to hear from you. Right, let's take another question now, which is from Amanda King. Good evening. I hope everyone can hear me. We can, Amanda. We had a little trill to, to, as well as you started talking. It was rather lovely. So what's your question? Uh, do you think the government was right to wait until the first day of term to announce school closures? Annalise. Well, I have to say we found the last few days around this issue of schools opening very, very frustrating. I mean, we were continually saying to government, what is the evidence around this? Um, I have to say, as Labour Party, we really didn't want to see schools closing. You know, we still want schools to be the last places to close and the first places to reopen. Well, you were, we calling, know... you were calling for them to stay open on Monday morning and then Monday afternoon you changed your mind. Well, no, with, with respect, that, that wasn't what happened. And Keir Starmer, the Labour leader... But the Shadow Education Secretary said concerned. on Monday morning she well, wanted the schools to stay open and in the afternoon all, he said they want to say he wanted them closed. If at all possible... And we still want schools to be open where at all possible because we know the well, impact. Well, everyone wants them to stay open, of course, well, if we but can. With, with respect, I think we've entered a situation now where they have been closed because government says it's acting on that evidence that it's necessary now, but we haven't seen put into place the e-learning that's necessary for those children so that they really can be receiving the kind of educational input that they need. And we've had so many months when this has been potentially on the cards. We had the first lockdown where there wasn't that provision. It's still not there. You know, now we're saying to government, I suppose related to what Dave was saying before about looking forwards, we need to have a plan for when they're going to be able to reopen. You know, what will the conditions be so that we can get schools reopened? How are we going to deal with all these issues about digital divides and about educational disadvantage? Because this period has been really tough for so many families and we need a much stronger response from government than what we've seen so far. Josh, you've got your hand up. So today in Parliament, Gavin Williamson um, said that he would trust teachers into deciding students' grades rather than allowing them to go through exams. And yet he won't trust teachers to decide when, the, when they shouldn't be in and out of school. When people go for jobs, there's people on this panel that we've spoken to already that are vastly experienced, and that's the reason they're in that job. Gavin Williamson is the most... Un it's, it's unbelievable how his experience lacks so vastly in this job. As someone, as an education minister, I have to say that I think he's the worst that Britain's ever seen, and I think it's about time that he left that post effective immediately. Uh, James, you're nodding your head vigorously to that. Yeah, I, I just think it's woeful, the constant U-turns, you know, this new variant was a surprise, the second wave wasn't, to get kids in school one day and put teachers at risk, put families at risk, and then to pull them out the next, it's embarrassing really, and you're right, Gavin Williamson is pathetic, it, it's, it is embarrassing. Uh, Alex? Yeah, I was just going to mention uh, Eat Out to Help Out. It feels like we should not have done that. Instead, um, spent the money on making sure our kids, the most vulnerable in society, had access to broadband, a laptop or a device. Just think of it as a 21st century textbook. Every kid in the UK should have that. Instead, we spent it on Eat Out to Help Out. Susan? Susan to Susan? Uh, 
Can I can I just come in on that point about eat out to help out? Um, yes, schools are extremely important. It's incredibly important that children are able to learn. But we also have a hospitality industry and we also have a live entertainment industry. And those are things we should be very, very proud of in this country. And we are just going to lose them. And I took full advantage of Eat Out to Help Out. I think I actually ate at 22 restaurants in August alone. Whoa! Um, Hang on a minute. So you single-handedly <laughs> probably propped the whole thing up. Well, the, the first week I, I only went three times a week, but then by the second week I realised that I should go for lunch and dinner. OK. <laughs> so, okay. Um, but listen, let's <clears throat> bring us back, because the question is about school closures. Now, in our panel, Nicola, you haven't got your hand up, but you are a teacher. So what, what's your view of Amanda's question? Was the government right to enter, wait until the first day of term to announce the closures? Yeah, I mean, I think there's no doubt that they weren't correct. I think, um, uh, you know, we could, we could see in schools that that numbers were rising and that teachers and students were, were struggling to be in school and struggling to staff school and struggling to, I guess, feel safe and provide the education that we, we need to, really. And I'd just like to agree about what's been said about Gavin Williamson. I think today, again, you know, we saw very vague announcements about um, exam grades, and that just leads to more stress for our young people. And this, these are the young people that are the future generation, and they've had such a lot to put up with, and they've just had more of that uncertainty today. Well, Nadim, I assume you're going to want to defend your colleague. Um, because clearly there's been a lot of criticism of Gavin Williamson. What was that about, really? Deciding, mm. saying on Sunday, schools are absolutely safe, uh, in the kids go on Monday, and by the end of Monday saying, oh, hang on, we're going to completely change our mind. No, they're not safe after all. It was last resort. The last thing we want to do is to close schools. And one that you the, really couldn't reasons. see coming for all 24 the hours. Well, because, no, because for all the reasons that everybody, I think, would, would share, which is... This, these are our future. These are the, the, the future generations and their education is incredibly important. Hence why Gavin Williamson has put, I think we're at to, about 750,000 laptops have gone out to the most um, vulnerable uh, children uh, that need them. Um, their department's got two um, uh, uh, deals with two providers, I think Virgin E, to provide uh, the ability for those children to be able to log on and, and get that online tuition. Can as I well clarify as, uh, something, I Nadine, that's in your... Hang on, BBC. just a second. I Can I, I want to compliment Are you going to shout out for the BBC? I want to compliment okay. the BBC okay. coming forward so admirably to say that they'll offer three hours of education for, for both secondary and primary school is a fantastic thing, and thank you, Tim Davey. Uh, for doing he's what he's done. Can I just ask um, you something, just, just I, to, to I understand just get, it? I just want to get to in the your, no, just one second. In your guidelines, mm. um, the Department of Education guidelines say children who may have difficulty engaging with remote education at home because of a lack of devices or a quiet place to study are classed as vulnerable. Mm. So they can go, just, just as a point yeah. of information, so children who are in that position, can they go to school at the moment? Yes, and, and those of obviously the, the, the front line uh, who are protecting everyone from, from this... Uh, evil virus. And but children who don't have access to a laptop, they very. can go to school at so, the so, moment. So those children that are, that are vulnerable and... Because they don't have access to a laptop they're, they're, or, or they, a mobile, exactly. a, a device they yes, can use. Yes. So they can so, go to school. But we're trying to make sure that those children get the laptop and get... Sure. The, obviously OK, but just so we're clear, because I'm not sure, sure how well known that was, but they can go to school as of tomorrow. So the, the, both the vulnerable children um, and the children of the front line can, can go to school, as we did in the first uh, lockdown, you, re you will recall. Uh, but look, everybody here will, will I think, understand. You know, it, it, this is a difficult situation. Every country, you know, someone talked about Israel earlier and how well they're doing on vaccination. Israel this week is debating another lockdown and the closure of schools. Uh, so this is happening all around the world. Uh, we're having to cope with this virus. We've got this new variant, which clearly is um, spiking, not just in London and the southeast, but actually in the Midlands, we're seeing it in the rest of the country, which is why the lockdown has come in. And my job is to make sure that the NHS plan for vaccinations is delivered so that by the middle of February, those first four categories, the most vulnerable four categories, and if we, by the way, if you get through the nine categories, uh, we essentially deal with 99% of mortality, of deaths. And when do you COVID. think you'll have done that, Brian? Well, you can pretty much do the maths because if by mid-February I've done the first four categories in terms of uh, 
roughly 14 million people being offered the vaccine. The total nine categories is about 26 million people. Uh, but we'll continue to increase, obviously, as we get more volume. But it, and it's well, just worth saying that on the news this evening, someone from University College Hospital was saying that the average age of their people in intensive care was 60. Right, and that's what we're seeing locally so, as well. So which is why we need to get you are the full, a long full, way off. Which is why I said the nine categories, yeah. Mark, which deals with... Because actually I know you seeing, said we could do the maths, but so just do it for us. When do you think you'll get to the end of the nine categories? Well, I, I, my, my target is mid-February for the first four cohorts. I'm happy to come back. We're going to be publishing daily numbers so the whole nation can see where we're at as we increase. We will do it as soon as possible, but I'm hoping the, the, the nine categories by spring will be done. Please, may I ask, Nadeem, a very quick, simple question, and I would really love a simple answer. This is a question on behalf of all those teachers who are in and out of schools now, looking after, for instance, key workers' kids, but all teachers who will be going back into schools when this lockdown is lifted. Can you please, on behalf of the teaching profession tonight, guarantee that when this lockdown is lifted, and when teachers go back into schools, they will all have received a vaccination. So the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation, this came up earlier on BAME cohorts, looked at all different cohorts, key workers, BAME uh, people, and they decided very clearly that those that are most vulnerable are the nine categories that they've set us, because age is the predictor, back to Mark's point, and sage of mortality, of death from COVID. Once we do phase one, teachers are right up there in terms of first in line. Now, some of them will be vulnerable and will be in phase one uh, of the nine, you know, delivering the nine cohorts. But to be able to protect the most vulnerable and the front line, NHS workers and, and social care, we have to follow the Joint Committee on Vaccination okay. and, and, and Immunisation. No, I'm uh, going to take another question if I course, can. We haven't got course. much time. I just want to squeeze it in if I can. From James Alcock. Furlough is absolutely vital, but only if there remains a solvent company to be furloughed from. Rishi Sunak said he would do whatever it takes to support SMEs. When did the government change tack from this and why? And James, what's your experience? And you, you run a, a pub, is that right? Uh, a, a small restaurant, yes. Um, I mean, all the packages from the Chancellor are fine, but I've been there press conference after press conference wondering, is Rishi Sunak going to appear? What's he going to offer? And all the packages you know, whilst they're better than nothing, they're not enough. And what's the true cost of not supporting us over the line at this last stage? Otherwise, that money's going to go to waste. And, you know, let me tell you, I had to get universal credit at the start of this pandemic. And apparently, I've got to give the money back now because I earn too much. Well, I don't earn too much. Rishi Sunak needs to either sharpen his pencil and get with the programme or get back home and get on 80% of his income for himself and sit on furlough because it's no picnic. Humphrey. Well, look, my, my heart goes out to James and the many other hundreds of thousands of operators of smaller businesses in the UK. You know, it's, it's tough as a large business operator as well, but uh, people um, pushing forward on their own like that, I think it's a tremendous you know, contribution. And, and I would echo James's views. I mean, it's always difficult when somebody gives you something and the Chancellor, Chancellor gave something out this week uh, to not be grateful for it. And we are grateful for it. Every little helps. But it really is not in line with the promise that he made to do whatever it takes uh, to support businesses. Um, tremendously tough for businesses like ours that have had to close down and take pain and like, like James's on behalf of society as a whole. And what um, I'm arguing for, and I'm sure James would as well, um, is for proportionate support relative to the impact on businesses. Um, such as ours in the gym and fitness centre. You know, I run a, a large chain of budget uh, gyms in, in that arena. We've had to close by the end of February. It will be for 30 weeks out of the prior 50. James will have been in a similar position. You know, badly impacted businesses require more proportionate and targeted support. And I, I think actually Annalise has been quite vocal about this um, as well. I think it's a really important area. We really want to work with government on behalf of our own business, but many other businesses like James is out there um, I, I know it's not easy for the Chancellor or for government, and you know, credit to them, they put a lot of effort into this, but I think there's much more we can do. Otherwise, otherwise, what we will face is a sort of economic long COVID um, of businesses that are struggling to stay afloat uh, for a long period of time, and we won't be able to reflate the economy and build the growth back and get us going again. It's going to be so important to provide the services that we want and the jobs and the future that we all want in the future from this. Colette, you are nodding vigorously to that. 
I'm sorry, I'm standing here, I'm sitting here, I'm going, oh, I mean, there's so much here, and I, I, I completely align with Humphrey, and I think this comes back to something that Mark was saying as well. I mean, I'm in the hair and beauty sector, um, and there's a couple of things. We get the chancer that goes on TV, and we get all kind of the roadmap of what they're going to do and all this offer of help, which is amazing. But the problem is, we're not seeing that come through. So in our sector, we've been excluded from VAT cuts, but yet we've been locked down as long as other sectors. Secondly, um, we've been promised grants from councils. A lot of these councils are holding on to the money and it's not coming through to small businesses. Um, and I think with anybody here who's a business, I want to come back to something that Mark said. If you don't look after your businesses and your employers, who are going to provide jobs? So this is the problem. You know, we're kind of having such unfair treatment across all sectors. And not just that, devolved governments are actually getting more money than some businesses in England. So it's disproportionate and unfair. And I think, I'm an accountant as well, by the way, as a hairdresser. So the problem is with that, I just see a really, 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 like Humphrey says, an absolutely a long COVID problem for employment when we are part of the solution, not the problem. We want to help, but we can't unless people actually give us the lifelines we so need. Amanda? Oh, Amanda, we need to hear you. Sorry. There we go. Um, yeah, I'm actually one of the few individuals who's a sole trader um, who actually runs um, and what is classified as an essential business um, uh, on the high street. Uh, but the, there's been the announces of these grants, and that's great, but it, it has been clear it's for those uh, businesses that have to close. Um, and yet, we are on the high street, there's just us, the butchers and a uh, doctors. Um, there's nobody going past their shop to, um, to, for us to sell uh, goods to. And you run a pet so, shop, don't you, Amanda? I, d I have got a pet shop, yes. Um, so we're not selling any animals, um, you know, it's not appropriate, but um, it's pet food. And uh, Consequently, people aren't, are finally coming at, um, and staying at home, which is good. But, um, you know, really, the only people that are passing us is either going to the butchers or going, they're sick and they're going to the doctors and they want to go home. There's, there is no support for us. And okay. the saddest thing about it is to keep open, we're having to reduce our hours to make sure I can afford to keep my staff going, who, you know, we're all self-employed. Um, and we we fall yet again through the gaps and we don't get anything. Andrea. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, so I'm also self-employed and I've also fallen through the gaps completely. Um, I have a workroom in my own house, so I don't qualify for a business grant. Um, I don't have stock, so I don't qualify for any other subsidies. Um, I tried to look at the um, self-employed version of the furlough scheme, not applicable to me. So there's absolutely nothing. There's huge amounts of talk within the Conservative government about supporting all small businesses, about trying to get um, small industry crafts people going and get some creativity in there. Um, but why is it so difficult for anybody to get anything unless you're either got three accountants working for you or practically destitute? Annalise. Well, I think we've just heard from so many people there quite how hard it is for businesses at the moment in the UK. And unfortunately, we are in a situation where our country's had the worst recession of all major economies. We've had that awful double tragedy, terrible health outcomes, and a very, very poor economic situation as well. And I would just say that, you know, the Chancellor talks about how he's put 280 billion pounds into his plan for jobs. That is a very significant investment, but so much of that money has not been targeted effectively. You know, we've seen the supermarkets, for example, they've been giving money back actually, they've given money back that they received through the grant scheme. Where is that gone? We said as Labour, we think that should be focused on some of those people like Andrea, who've been missed out of those schemes, some of the excluded groups. But you weren't criticising those grants for the supermarkets at the time. 
because we we, we have consistently said that we think that support should be better targeted. We did point to the fact that, for example, in Labour run Wales, they didn't have that grant support going to the very, very large companies. They did target it more. If you look at the self-employed income support grant, you got with the initial phases of that exactly the same amount if your profit had gone down by one pound as if it had been wiped out completely. Now, the point is, again, going back to what Dave said before, it's not dwelling on the past, it's looking to the future. What do we need to do now? We need to have a longer term time scale. You know, we saw yet again, Prime Minister earlier this week, new restrictions, no word about economic support then, then the Chancellor running to catch up. We can't have that again. We need a longer term plan for businesses, especially those that have got a lot of debt now, you know, the kind of pubs like James's and, and others where they've racked up that debt. How can we help them in the future to actually be keeping their staff on, hopefully getting additional staff in place as well? Nadine. So, uh, James, to your question, the Chancellor, and I think Annelies just spent the 280 billion, what does that really mean uh, to a business like yours? Um, first of all, the local authorities, and I agree with uh, Colette, they should be making those grants uh, land into businesses. Um, and thank you for, for, for nodding there. And that needs to happen. I, as business minister, before I was given this uh, role as the vaccine deployment minister, actually got on the phone and called something like 89 chief executives when we did the initial tranche of grants to say, how many have you got out? Have they been delivered? Because that needs to happen. And my message, as would be Rishi Sunak's message, is that needs to happen because he's just made another half a billion available to local authorities to target the most needy small businesses, as well as uh, for uh, restaurants and your business, James. I think you, you said you've got a, a, a restaurant, a, restaurant. Or a, a small uh, uh, restaurant. £9,000 grant, not loan, grant now for this period, as well as... It's up to 9000 so it's not... As, you, hang on, so James, are you getting well the 9000 as, as well as the 3000 uh, a month for being closed. Um, so we, should we just I'm hear back from James? Because that, that's his, James. his experience. Of James, are you, are you getting that, that 9,000? No, uh, and I'm a bit fed up of always giving the top line figure. You know, I actually get £4,000. And with respect, Nadim, I didn't ask you to list what you've already done. I asked you to tell me why you've stopped doing enough. I know what's been done. I'm, I'm fully aware of what's been done. But what's happening right now is not enough. It's taking too long. The promise is of doing everything you can have gone. These companies are on a knife edge. Why should I borrow £45,000 to keep my small business afloat? It only cost me 100 k to set it up. I might as well not bother. But the £4.5 was just announced, literally, uh, after the Prime Minister announced the lockdown. Um, so this is new support for the... targeted very much at the hospitality sector. There is also, of course, you know, the... the, the when I was in, you know, dealing with this... You've got about department. 10 seconds left, but you have to be brief, I'm afraid. The youngest people and the Kickstarter scheme, £2 billion to get them into training for six months to end up in a, in a job. Okay. They are the most important. That's where you need to target the people who are most vulnerable to losing their jobs. Nadine, thank you. Our hour is up. We are going to have to stop there. Thank you very much to the panel for coming tonight. Humphrey, thank you for joining us down the line from Oxfordshire. And thank you very much to our first audience of our QT50. I'd have loved to have heard more from you. We will do over the next few weeks and months. Thank you very much. And, of course, thank you to you at home for watching from Question Time. Bye-bye. <laughs>